Hello and welcome to the Accent Podcast, where I, Asnor Midov, interview accomplished investors, entrepreneurs, business and thought leaders about their personal and professional journeys. In this episode, I sit down with Guy Kawasaki, a chief evangelist of Canva. Guy is widely known around the world for his various business ventures, his books and speeches on entrepreneurship, and his early work at Apple. We spoke about his new book, Wise Guy, his life and his career as a business operator and as an investor. I'll let you listen for yourself. Guy, thank you very much for joining the podcast. It's a pleasure and honor. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. There's so much to discuss because your life is full of different things that we can only imagine. I was estimating that it probably would take five, six episodes of this podcast to cover everything. <laughs> uh, yeah. But we only have one episode and one hour of your time. So we'll try to cover everything possibly can. So you are chief evangelist of Canva. You're a brand ambassador of Mercedes. You're on the Wikipedia Foundation board member, plus your father, your husband, and <laughs> good friend. So why don't we just take it one thing at a time? Tell us about Canva. How did you discover it? And what's your role as a chief evangelist? Canva is an online graphics design service based out of Sydney, Australia, and it enables really anybody to create great graphics. I like to tell people that you can create a great graphic in the time it takes you to boot Photoshop. So we, uh, we create literally millions of designs every day. We sign up tens of thousands of new customers every day and they make presentations, social media graphics, book covers, posters, flyers. I mean, you name it, anything that has an image we handle. So that's Canva, and I'm the chief evangelist, so I'm supposed to spread the good news of Canva. Which you already did just now. <laughs> so how do people sign up? Do we just go well, to the website and we just go to canva.com. Uh, there's an Android app, an iOS app, and, of course, desktop access. Got it. And I'm, I'm sure you use it yourself, right? Oh, yeah. You used to be a chief evangelist of Apple, right, years yes. ago. Yes. Can you kind of tell us how has this role changed over the years? Especially well, with the arrival of social media. Well, uh, the role for Apple or the role for chief evangelist? Because the role oh, for chief, Apple, evang chief evangelist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when, when you're a trillion dollar company, you don't need evangelists. Oh, of course, of course. I'm trying to kind of compare like when you first became chief evangelist of Apple, you, yeah. you had set, uh, certain tasks and certain goals to achieve. How is it different from Canva? Well, the, when I was chief evangelist of Apple, it was to help keep Apple alive. Uh, it was to help the Macintosh cult to remain loyal to Apple. So that's not the case with Canva. Canva is not in a try to survive mode. Uh, we're completely in a growth mode. So that's very different. You know, getting away from Canva and Apple per se, the difference now is social media. And social media just enables evangelism to be done so much better. Because basically, social media is fast and free and ubiquitous. So you can reach people all over the world instantly for free. How can it get any better than that? So how was it different back then? What, I understand that without social media, there is less access. But what did you do? Did you call around or what was the original? Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, this was before. If you were really cool, I mean, really, really cool, you had a cell phone in your car. Uh, and, you know, it weighed <laughs> probably 20 pounds. So now it's completely different. And we use plain old telephone system. We use face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, we use airplanes and cars. Today's evangelists can still, of course, use that. But there's no such thing as Facebook Live or LinkedIn Live. There's no sharing of desktops. There's no Skype. Uh, there's no Zoom. <laughs> it's a very different world now. Got it. So you're also a brand ambassador of Mercedes-Benz. Yes. What do you do as a brand ambassador and uh, how did you end up with that role? Well, Mercedes-Benz brand ambassador, uh, I'm one of the few people in the world who's not a Formula One driver who gets paid to drive a Mercedes. Let's just put it that way. And so they <sighs> have... It's too good to be true, you know? <laughs> you know, somebody's got to do it. So they, there are about, I think, eight or 10 Mercedes-Benz corporate brand ambassadors. So it's myself, a woman named Susan Wolf was one of the first F1 drivers, female, uh, Garrett McNamara, big wave surfer, Roger Federer, tennis player. Uh -huh. So these are people who are you know, visible, have credibility, and sort of the, 
the halo effect. You know, if the world's greatest tennis player uses a Mercedes or drives a Mercedes, you probably would like to drive a Mercedes too. And so that's what it involves. Um, in, in my case, obviously I'm not a world-class tennis player or surfer or Formula One driver, but I come from the, the tech field and the social media field. So they want my visibility in those fields. And I do appearances for them. I moderate panels for them. I speak for them. You know, I don't play tennis or surf or drive cars with them. Just to be clear, you literally drive Mercedes Benz and they pay you for that. Yeah, you want to see my car? <laughs> no, I, I actually saw it. I just want to, I saw on YouTube you were presenting, I think it's a new model or something. Yeah, the very, very cool. Yes. I just couldn't believe that that's, that is such a role. How do I sign up? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm happy to drive the, the economy yeah, class yeah. or whatever they have. Well, anyway. I mean, and this goes back to your earlier question, which I forgot to answer. You know, how did I hook up with Canva? And now you're asking how I hooked up with Mercedes. Well, in a sense, you can't call them. I didn't call Canva. Canva called me. In Mercedes' case, I called them because I wanted to visit their factory because I love to go to car factories. So I visited their car factory and we got along great and i said well let's, let's do more and so the bottom line is they're not trying to make people famous they're trying to fee- find people who are already famous and influential so that's what it takes so you know it took me 40 years to become a mercedes-benz brand ambassador basically oh yeah okay so i have a goal now good yeah, <laughs> you do you do <laughs> guy tell us about the wikimedia foundation and your role on it Well, the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the sort of parent of Wikipedia, uh, I was on the board for two years. Now, I'm no longer on the board. And I joined that because I think what they do is very important. And this was two years ago that I was on the board of Wikipedia. And it is even more important now because of how news and fake news and Mm -hmm. trolls and doxing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Wikipedia, I think, is... One of the few, if not the only place you can truly trust because, you know, they have such high standards and there's such sort of thrashing going on that yields, you know, what's close to the truth or not fake news. So you're well known as, as an author. You wrote, I think, 14 books, if I'm not, if I'm not uh, wrong. Well, wise guy, you know. <laughs> wise guy, which we're going to discuss guy. shortly. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Wise guy. Well, I think it was 14th, right? Uh, it's 50. 15th. Yeah. Wow, wow, fantastic. My wife and I both read it and we both liked it. And in in fact, she finished it first and she was kind of advising me how to structure this interview. That's great. So where did your passion for writing come from? Well, that's an interesting question. I I just, I started writing books in 1987 and I never stopped. And believe me, in 1987, I wrote The Macintosh Way. I thought that was the last book I would ever write. (laughs) <laughs> so I've just continued to write it. You know, it's as close as I have been able to come to being an engineer in the sense that <laughs> engineers make stuff, right? But I was a marketeer. So I was always marketing somebody else's stuff. But with books, I am creating. And that's very different and very satisfying. So tell us about The Wise Guy. What is the book about when and why you decide to write it? Well, it's about 25 bucks. Um, <laughs> uh The book is a collection of stories from my life, how they influenced my life and what I learned, you know, what's the wisdom of these stories. So if if your audience is familiar with the chicken soup books, uh, this is like Guy's version of chicken soup. All the stories are mine. Chicken soup is outside contributors. They're all mine. And uh, think of it as miso soup for the soul. So these are stories (laughs) that had big influences on my life. And I, I like to pass on the wisdom and the lessons to people. And I like how you're very candid about many subjects that people don't talk about. You use the word nepotism so many times. It kind of cracks <laughs> me up. It's, it's a good, what's something that people call networking, you call nepotism. I was like, this is very interesting well, you approach. Know, network, networking is when you know people and you, know, you go to cocktail parties and whatever. Nepotism is when you hire your friend or your relative. Mike Boych was my college roommate, and he hired me into Apple. That's nepotism. That's <laughs> well, I'm sure he wouldn't hire you if he didn't see you doing an amazing job, right? It's not like... One hopes. <laughs> one hopes. Yeah, so how about the other books? 
I was thinking to spend maybe 20 seconds on each of these books. Maybe you could give us a very high overview of what this is a book about and who would benefit from it. Okay, uh, go ahead, fire away. Okay, Art of the Start. Uh, basically, uh, uh, the only guide you need to starting a company. Everything is in there. Got it. The Art of Social Media. How do you use social media as a platform? Ape. How to self-publish a book. <laughs> Enchantment. How to influence and persuade people. What the plus? Uh, that was how to use Google Plus, which, you know, obviously you don't need to read now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Reality check. Reality check is a, a, a book about how the real world works for an entrepreneur. So, you know, this is all tough news. And I will tell you, if you read The Art of the Start 2, you probably don't need to read Reality Check also. Ah, uh, you just kill your sales. Come on. Yeah, well, but you don't yeah. do that. <laughs> Rules of Revolutionaries. Uh, this is how to create innovative and curve-jumping products and services. Selling the Dream. Selling the Dream is how to use evangelism. The Macintosh Way. Macintosh Way was the first book. It describes how to do the right things the right way. Uh, how you drive your uh, competition crazy. Uh, this is when you, know, you, you want to do something that makes your competition crazy because you're succeeding so much. Hindsights. Hindsights is a collection of interviews of people about their hindsights in their life. So in a sense, you know, hindsights is interviews with, I don't know, 20 or 30 people. Wise guy is as if I interviewed myself. Got it. Or what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Database 101? Uh, how are the, I was working for a Macintosh database company at the time. So this is a, a primer to databases. You know, what's a file, what's a field, what's a record, those kind of things. So uh, introduction to database technology. You did great. It was even faster than I thought. <laughs> so, Guy, what I want to do now is to learn more about you as a person. Yeah. And for that purposes, we want to go all the way back to your childhood. Yeah. What do you think? Go ahead. So where were you born and grew up? I was born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, in a place called Kalihi Valley, which is a lower income part of Hawaii. And what was the place like during your childhood? Uh, well, I mean, we were poor, but we weren't, you know, we weren't starving. We, we, you know, we, I was fed and clothed. I didn't have a... Yes, you know, terrible childhood. I didn't overcome poverty. Uh, I had a nice lower middle class childhood. I didn't, you know, I didn't know I was supposed to have more. <laughs> so I was happy. So, uh, you know, zooming out a little bit, there's not going to be a movie about this book because it, this is not one of those dramatic kind of books where I, I caught the last helicopter out of C South Vietnam. You know, the U.S. Navy dropped me off in Sacramento <laughs> with $5 and, you know, uh, a pair of shoes, and I had to make my life. Um, so you're saying this book is, is yeah, well, about something you know, there that are people, people can relate did to. Catch that last elevator. Uh, there are people who did catch that last helicopter. There are people who landed on Ellis Island with nothing but a suitcase. Uh, that's not what I'm about. And on the other hand, you know, it's not like I'm born into Donald Trump's family or you know uh, Richard Branson's son or something. So I'm on neither extreme. I'm kind of in the middle, nice, lower middle class upbringing. I wasn't abused as a child. I didn't have to overcome any drug addiction, you know, nothing like that. So that's why they're not going to make a movie about this. But I think I just described many people's lives. It's, it's not that dramatic extreme, sort of in the middle. And for those people, I have a lot of lessons that I think they can learn from. And if they have kids... I'm going to do them a big favor because, you know, they've probably been telling kids the same thing that I'm saying in the book, but now they can just hand them the book and say, just, just read this. Chat. I want to make <laughs> just read it. <laughs> you said you, you're growing up in Hawaii. Were you the only uh, child in the family or you had siblings? No, I have a sister. I have an older sister. Which one of you was a troublemaker? Yeah. There's always one. Uh, neither of us, really. Right. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, no, I, I never, I got in trouble once for cutting art class, but that's about oh, it. Oh, that's not bad. And Guy, what were your parents' occupation? What did they do? Uh, my father was a fireman. Then he became a real estate broker. And then he ran for the state senate. He served in the state senate for a couple decades. My mom was a housewife. Nice. How did they influence yeah. you? Uh, they, they taught me all the values. You know, uh, noblesse oblige, uh, 
my mother in particular taught me always leave someplace neater than you found it. Uh, there are huge influences in my life. Yeah, you know, just the moral fiber. To the extent that I am moral, it's because of the. <laughs> Understand. That's fantastic. Do you have a favorite childhood memory? Really, my favorite childhood memory is, believe it or not, uh, we used to go on family picnics at a beach in Hawaii called Ala Moana. Mm. And um, I don't know, they just were beautiful, good times. You know, growing up in Hawaii is a beautiful experience. So, yeah. That one. The picnicking in Ala Moana Beach Park. And did you have any hobbies or, and do you still have them? Um, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I basically, I studied and I played football. That's all. <laughs> I love football. Did you want to be a football player when you grew up? Well, I mean, you know, I'm 5'8 and right now 195 pounds. So was, <laughs> but when you were a child, you didn't know. You... Yeah, but I love football. I didn't think I'd ever play pro football. I loved football. But what, who did you want to be when you grew up? I don't even remember. <laughs> I have no clue. Were you a good student at school? Uh, this is a very funny story. So I went to Stanford, so I must have been something of a good student. Uh, and so I kind of you know, remember me as being a very good student. But in doing research for this book, I found an old report card that I published in the book <laughs> where my English teacher is saying, you know, you're doing C-level work. It's not appropriate for an honors English class. I mean, I don't remember that. <laughs> so you remember only good things, huh? Uh, how did you end up at uh, Stanford and why did you pursue psychology degree? Well, I ended up at Stanford. I got into Occidental, which is a school that Barack Obama went to, University of Hawaii, Stanford, and I don't, I don't remember where else I applied. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got into Stanford, but I could have played football at Occidental. It's a small school. And my father told me, you know, if I'm spending all this money on tuition, you're going to Stanford. You're not going to Occidental. So it's either Stanford or the University of Hawaii. Pick one. So I picked Stanford. Good choice. And you graduated, and then I, I believe you pursued MBA at UCLA, right? Well, uh, I, I graduated from Stanford, and the next year I went to law school. Oh, because, okay. You know, that's what Asians did in, in, in the <laughs> 70s. Either went to law dentistry or, or um, medical in the 70s asian americans became doctors or lawyers or dentists and i didn't want to stick my hand in people's bodies so that only left law <laughs> uh, and i hated law school so i quit after two weeks i went back to hawaii and worked for the lieutenant governor's office i came back the following year and went to ucla for an mba why did you decide to go to pursue mba I, I wanted to be in business. I wanted to start a company. I, you know, I loved the idea of business. Was it any exposure to business prior or how did you realize that that's what you want to do? Hard to remember. That's a long time ago. Uh, I think I just fell in love with the idea of being an entrepreneur. Got it. What was your first job after graduation and what was the most important thing you learned from it? Oh, I went straight into the jewelry company that I was working for. So I went from MBA to jewelry manufacturer. And that's kind of a funny story because, you know, not many people go from an MBA to a jewelry manufacturer. They go to work for yeah, Goldman Sachs or yes. Wells Fargo or, you know, McKinsey. But I went into a small family-owned jewelry company because they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And I really enjoyed the business. Not that I'm into jewelry that much. And from that company and that industry, I learned how to sell. And selling is a highly personal skill and highly useful. So uh, that just helped me the rest of my career. So what was your path to Apple? My path to Apple was nepotism. <laughs> that my college roommate gave me a job. Seriously. Seriously. It was, like that, it was, that's simple? He just called you and told you well, to I mean, get a job? Obviously, he didn't think I was an idiot. But yeah, basically, that was it. Got it. And were you offered the position of evangelist from the start or you kind of grew no, into it? I interviewed for another job and I wasn't right for the job. It wasn't right for me. Six months later, he called me again. And this time it was for evangelism. And this time, you know, I took it and the rest is history. So what was Apple like back then? Oh, it was, you know, we worked for Steve Jobs. It was magical. <laughs> and we were out to change the world, you know, best years of my life. He was a difficult person to work for, but no you know what? way. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't trade that for anything. I mean, I am what I am to a large degree because of Steve Jobs at Apple. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 
Could you share like a story from the from your first tenor at Apple? Yeah, well, so one day I'm sitting in my cube. Steve Jobs shows up with someone I never met. He asks me what I think of a company. I tell him the company and its products are mediocre. And after just ripping into that company, he then says, "I want you to meet the CEO." Of- <laughs> That's cold. <laughs> Total setup. Yeah. But I'm sure if you weren't this honest, he probably would disappointed at you, right? Yeah, I might have been fired because you know he probably thought the the product was crap too. So if he thought it was crap and I thought it was good, that could have been the end of my career at Apple. Yeah. So a lot a lot has been written about Apple and Steve Jobs, but can you tell us about some other uh, key people who played major role in the company but never made it to the history books? Uh, I mean. There was Mike Murray who came up with lots of the marketing of Macintosh, uh, lots of the cleverness of it, and there were a series of female direct reports. You know, he was way ahead of his time. So he had a female CFO, female person in charge of the factory, female in charge of marketing, female in charge of product marketing, and our outside PR agency was run by the account was run by a woman. Um, there's a lot of women who made Steve successful. Oh, that's impressive. And why did you leave the company? To start a company. I left it twice to start a company each time. Really? Which one was the first one? Uh, one was ACI US, was a Macintosh relational database. Second one was to start garage.com, uh, which was a venture capital investment bank. So at ACI US, yeah. what did you learn during the tenure at the company as a CEO? Well, I, you know, I didn't get along with the co-founder, so that became an issue. Uh, although one of the co-founders now is a very close friend of mine and uh, i i loved selling stuff you know it's from a jewelry days and so it's not like banking right so what is banking you know you you like borrow money at one percent and you loan money at 1.1 percent you know i mean you're not yeah. making something right so, yeah i'm a banker by the way just oh, FYI. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you know I'm but they, exactly that's what i i, I agree with you <laughs> okay. good so I, I love that back then, you know, there's actually physical software on a disc and there's manuals and you shrink wrap it, right? So pallets of boxes went out the back. I mean, I love that. I love that. I understand. Then you decided to leave the company. Is it because of your relationship with the co-founders? Or yeah, you yeah, ideas? it was. And, you know, I, I, then I sort of writer, speaker. I mean, I started a company, another company. I went back to Apple as chief evangelist when Apple was supposed to die, started another company and you know, the rest is history. So you, you went back to Apple again, right? What yeah. was the circumstances of that? The circumstances was at the time Apple was supposed to die and the Macintosh cult, the Macintosh developer community was you know, sort of leaving Apple. So my job was to make sure they stuck with Apple. And you did it so successfully, right? I guess. I mean, Apple's still there. Was it, after Steve Jobs come back? I was there and he came back after he sold next to Apple. Mm-hmm. So we barely overlapped. Oh, I see. Yeah. And, and then you decided to leave again and you started garage.com or garage yeah. ventures, right? Yeah. So what is the story behind garage.com? Uh, we wanted to democratize venture capital. So it wouldn't be that, you know, only entrepreneurs who already knew venture capitalists could get venture capital. And we also wanted to make it so that you know, more people could invest in tech startup. We wanted to democratize both sides of the venture capital game. And what was some example of the companies you guys worked with? Uh, your- well, one is, um, God, there's, this, there's a company called Tripwire that did security. There's, uh, we work with Pandora. Oh, we know that one. But you know what? I mean, I wish I could tell you, you know, we did eBay or, Facebook or something like that. We never had a mega hit, but we've had you know singles and doubles. Oh, which is good. Yeah. So do you prefer the role of the investor or of an operator? Operator. I'll oh. never be an investor again. Really? Why is that? Well, you know what? I'll never be an operator again either. I mean, I'm not an operator at Canva in the sense that I have a staff and I have to go in every day. I just, I don't like the investor role because you have to say no 99.9% of the time and even when you say yes, you know you're going to beat the crap out of the guy or the gal later because, you know, they're not going to meet their budget. And then you have to deal with other venture capitalists who are all jerks. I mean, it's just not my idea of fun. understand. So 
you've been around Silicon Valley for more than 30 years as an employee yeah. of an iconic company, as an entrepreneur, as an investor, a thought leader. I want to kind of gain some lessons from you. Okay. What does it take to build a successful company? It takes luck and a great product. How do you define luck? Luck is luck. I mean, you're in the right place at the right time. The timing is good. Uh, I also believe that luck happens to people who work hard, but you know, a lot of things have to come in, in play. It's not just your personal brilliance and vision. I mean, lots of things have to happen right. And what about good product? How do you define that? Good product is anticipating what people will need before they realize it. What are the most important qualities successful entrepreneurs share? Being lucky. <laughs> and creating the right product. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, seriously, that's kind of it. I mean, you have to work hard. I think you have to be willing to hire people who are better than you at your job so that, you know, you're, you're not the smartest guy in the, in the room. That's what it takes. Yeah. My next, next question is most common mistakes entrepreneurs make. And I'm like thinking you're going to say, well, they're not lucky and they didn't produce right product. Well, <laughs> you know, obviously, but I think the most common mistake is that they, their, their projection for when they're going to finish something is way off. So whenever an entrepreneur tells you anything, just add a year to it. And uh, um, their financial projections are always way off. So not only do you add a year to it, you also multiply by 0.01. <laughs> yeah, we do work with some and we've noticed that sometimes. How do you manage your busy travel schedule, various businesses, and in the same time being a family man? Well, that assumes that I do that all well. But, um, you know, I work hard. Whenever I'm not traveling to make a speech, I am at home. I'm not in an office, right? So I don't have day-to-day -day responsibility. You know, I, I wake up in the morning. This morning, I woke up at 6.30. I made my son breakfast. I took him to, to school. And then I've been doing interviews all day. And, you know, that's what I do. I don't have to go in and work 60 hours at some building in Silicon Valley. What a fantastic life you're having, that guy. That's good. I do. I really you're do. You're not even Thank going you. to the office. You're driving your Mercedes to the office, right? <laughs> so, uh, Guy, I have a quick blitz. It's going to be a quick question, and I would expect you to give a brief answer to that. Okay. What's your favorite movie? Uh, a recent one that I just saw is Green Book. I love that movie. Uh, didn't it just win Oscars? I think it did. Yeah, yeah. It won an Oscar last night. Yeah. Nice. Good choice. Who's your favorite movie star? Denzel Washington. Your favorite singer or a band? You yeah, know, I really, I'm not a music guy. I don't care. I listen to whatever my kids put on the radio. So your favorite book among your books and some other books that you've read over your life? Uh, my favorite book among my books. That's like asking which of my children is my favorite child, right? Wise guy is probably the favorite. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's that. And then uh, my favorite book outside of my own book is If You Want to Write by Brenda Ulan. Because it inspired me to write and it can inspire anyone to do almost anything. So it's not about just about writing? No, I mean, it is about writing, but you can substitute any endeavor for writing. Understand. What's your favorite sport to watch? Hmm. I don't, I hardly ever watch sports. Uh, you know, my, my sport is social media. Okay. What's your favorite place in Bay Area? Uh, Santa Cruz. Your favorite country to visit? I was going to say Canada, Australia, or Turkey. That's an interesting <laughs> choice. Okay, they're quite different. Favorite historical figure? Favorite historical figure. Is Steve Jobs a historical figure at this point? Well, we can call him, yeah. <laughs> Steve Jobs. <laughs> Got it. What's the first item on your bucket list? My bucket list? My bucket list is complete. I mean, I've done everything. <laughs> oh, no, that's your lucky person. No, that's not necessarily true. I mean, I am a lucky person, but... You know, it could be a different interpretation is that not that I've done everything we're doing is that I'm happy where I am. Understand. Do you have any favorite quotes? Uh, some things need to be believed to be seen. So my final question, Guy, what advice would you pass down to young people today? How, how old are these people? Well, are they old enough to listen to you? <laughs> Uh, Teenager, teenagers. Teenagers. I would say 
I'll quote my mother, which is, <laughs> leave everywhere you go better than you, better than when you got there. Oh, that, it's beautiful. Guy, thank you very much again for your time. I, I very much appreciate it. And it's fantastic to have you on the podcast. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to The Accent Podcast. For more episodes, please visit theaccentpodcast.com. Until next time.